think at the end of the day, you know, I, I think we, we, at least towards the end of my, my tenure, we need, we really interpreted, and I think it was understood that we're uh, interpreted in health, the OSF commitment to open societies to mean that we needed to combat discrimination uh, within the healthcare system, to mean that we needed to uh, strive for laws and policies that were evidence and rights based, to mean that we needed to challenge the power order within the health space, which means challenging the health establishment, uh, and also uh, uh, create space and ensure meaningful uh, participation of civil societies uh, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, work to you know, increase transparency and hold authority to account. So you know, that's really, I think, how we became understood uh, and known, but that was, that was an evolution. So, think about you know, palliative care and morphines, think about harm reductions uh, and people struggling to access uh, 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 syringes and needles, for instance. Uh, think about, uh, 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 I think, a, a range of very uh, uh, practical struggles, for instance, to access uh, substitution therapies uh, for people who use drugs, etc. So, so I think that's the lens through which uh, OSF had uh, started to interrogate the role, it, the role it could play in that space. Access to medicines remained essential. Um, that, of course, if we wanted a different outcomes in terms of access to medicines, we would need to change the broader ecosystems of research and development and how it was shaped. But that there was a number of things that could be done in the short to medium term, but would require supporting a new generation of activists, moving beyond HIV AIDS, uh, looking not only at global debates and trade discussions, but how actually actual uh, challenges were uh, pronounced uh, in middle income countries uh, where, you know, I, I think most of the, or at least a lot of the, the most acute challenges were being seen. It was about building relationship with other movement and it was about reclaiming a political discourse, not only the technicalities of you know, what's in an IP law or a trade agreement, but reclaiming the narrative uh, and, and, and changing the, 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 the framing around medical pricing and innovation so that more people would question why is the industry not producing the medicines we need? And when they're producing medicines, why are they so expensive if we've already paid for it as part of the research through public funding? Uh, and, and really trying to, to um, yeah, reclaim that space, reclaim that narrative. So that's what we try to do. So a, a, new, uh, a new hepatitis C drug came to the market. And I think it rapidly became clear that this was a game changer as it was not only helping uh, sustain people and allow them to live, it was actually curing hepatitis. So that in and out of itself really changed the parameters. It's changed the game of people's trajectory with the disease, which would have gone from, you know, discovering you have it, being on medicines, and at some point maybe needing a transplant to actually being able to access the medicines that can cure. Um, and so I think in, in, in that sense, that was really a game changer. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the approach of the pharmaceutical industry um, was, of course, not only uh, to uh, patent the medicines and there were questions as to whether or not the patentability criteria was a, were legitimate uh, in terms of the novelty of the medicines that was being produced, uh, but also went on to price it uh, at uh, levels that were out of reach for most of those that would have, you know, most needed it uh, in low and middle income countries. I think it, it, it was really a mix of uh, intense uh, national advocacy in a number of countries, you know, things Brazil, Georgia, India, Thailand, Ukraine, Vietnam. It was bringing in the legal strategies with patent oppositions, uh, and it was really uh, trying to uh, reclaim the narrative, as I was mentioning earlier, around uh, uh, hepatitis C not being medicines not being accessible and the excessive. Uh, a pricing approach uh, that was prevalent at the time. Uh, and and, and it, I think it really took, uh, you know, very strongly uh, coordinated effort from a range of players, you know, from the IMAX and all their counterparts legally in all the countries where we worked, all the ways to 
uh, you know, the, 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 the various partner organizations in each of the countries that I've named, you know, together with some of the usual players like the MSFs and the others, uh, to really elevate uh, and reject the notion that the first breakthrough medicines for hepatitis C that could actually cure hepatitis C would not be accessible for those that needed them most. The Roma Health Sport Scholarship Program was, as its name indicates, a program that supported young Roma, uh, young, uh, you know, self-claimed Roma from uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Macedonia and Serbia, from those four countries specifically, to um, attend medical schools or nursing school. Uh, and, you know, it may seem like, okay, great, another scholarship program, but you're looking at countries where at the time they were just simply no Roma health professional. There were just simply no Roma medical doctor or one or two, you know, at the greatest exception. Um, and there was no uh, sense from young Roma themselves that uh, medical uh, studies was something they could aspire to. There were no role models, there were no pathways for them to access and act on what is something they may have aspired to. Um, and so I think the Roma Health Scholarship Program not only you know, created those avenues uh, for um, young Roma to act on their desire to, to become medical professional, but it also held the potential uh, by so doing, to change a very discriminatory health system from within uh, and basically to demonstrate uh, and show that not only could Roma, you know, be medical professionals, they could also, from within the health system, challenge the discriminations, challenge the injustice, challenge the exclusions not because they took care of other Roma, but because they took care as competent professional of everybody else. And that, that is very powerful. I, I think an important dimension of that program, it was not only the payment of the scholarships themselves. So of course, you know, they were, uh, they were the financial benefits of the scholarships, but together with the financial benefits were what uh, was called then uh, enrichment uh, dimensions to the programs that included uh, ensuring that uh, the students would have a mentor uh, from the mainstream medical profession. So that meant that a young Roma student would be mentored by, you know, a Macedonian professor or, you know, a medical doctor from a given hospital in Romania. There was also training in advocacy and an advocacy camp bringing together cohorts of students on a yearly basis uh, to not only breed a sense of community and support and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, sharing and engagements, but also create uh, a, a collective sense of emulation and what was possible uh, in that space. Uh, there were also the possibility to access small grants for particular projects that were dear to people's mind uh, and that they wanted to carry out. So, so it was really a much more than just the scholarship money. And I think that's also what generated the impact. I think it speaks more broadly in that specific case to how our, men, uh, our health media initiative evolved from what would have been, I think, a standard uh, communication PR approach to, uh, uh, to this body of work, to something that was much more forcefully anchored in understanding how to um, uh, uh, change attitudes and and, sh and and shape narratives that can change attitudes. Uh, and so really tapping much more into values, uh, into storytelling, uh, and into understanding audience so that one can craft both messages and use messengers in ways that can actually help achieve uh, a questioning and hopefully a change or an evolution in the audience's mind.